I love how you have the picture of him as a general. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> only he, private in the army. It, it's a, it's a, so he was a, he was a, a private in the army. He, he served um, very little. I mean, he's, he's basically conscript. He pretends he's a volunteer, but he was a conscript. Um, he's conscripted. He serves in the conscript bureau for a little while first. That's the really funny thing. So he knew everyone wasn't a volunteer because he literally spent time forcing others to go fight. And then he finally goes to war basically late 64, early 65. He ends up at a unit and then gets assigned to be a messenger. Uh, and so he, we actually, there was actually an accusation made in 1900 that he may never have seen combat. And we don't know how much combat he saw. And other accusations are that other, you know, rebuttals say, no, he did see combat, uh, even if he didn't see a lot. But he has campaign materials that he claims he had nothing to do with the printing of that claim that he did serve for three years, um, which is just patently false, right? And so um, when we, we sort of see this as a whole, right, we see Carr as a whole years later when he's the head of the United Confederate Veterans, how does he dress? He dresses as a Confederate general because he's a general of the United Confederate Veterans. He never says he was a general, of course. I mean, he doesn't lie about that, but he gives this appearance that he's this decorated general and he has all these these medals on him, on his side that are all like for reunions, but right. it makes him look like he's more military than he is. And his gravestone says General Julian Carr, um, Confederate soldier, right? And so he gains individually at the same time as he pushes his political agenda through these lies. And uh, and he, he sort of, as, as one of my friends once said, uh, he cosplays um, a, a Confederate general. <laughs> Uh, and perhaps that's unfair to him, but um, you know the the outfit is pretty. Um, it's fitting. <laughs> it, it, it's pretty funny. Uh, it, it is a funny image in retrospect to sort of see him and, and sort of think about the reality versus the way he depicts himself again and again, uh, and in the way he depicts other Confederates. Right at the same totally. time as he's, it's not just what he says about himself; it's what he says about all Confederates, and he exaggerates the number of. Confederates that UNC contributed, for instance, he just inflates them. He just invents some major generals um, randomly. He's just like, yeah, UNC had this many colonels and this many captains and this many generals. He just makes them up. Uh, yeah. uh, he just in inflates them. They don't exist. Um, and the letters exist between him and that President Venable, the head of the University of North Carolina, going back and forth where they're like, how many people were there? And he's like, oh, I'll just say this number. <laughs> I mean, he's just, he, he, it's blatant. Um, and, uh, but nobody really thought about it because nobody really bothered to look at lies. Um, and that wasn't sort of what we thought about when we, um, but it does, it does raise the question because the narrative that they put down, I think this is really important to think about, the narrative that Carr put down was the original narrative that the next generation of historians started from. And their narrative is the next generation that the next generation, the Bruce Cattons based their histories of them. And Bruce Catton's narrative was the narrative that the next generation based mm -hmm. their narrative of them. And when you, right. and then that generation of historians is the one we based our first narrative on. And when you fall back, when you're writing about something niche, right? When you're writing about whatever it is you're writing about, when you need to fill in the gaps, what do we do? Mm -hmm. We fall back on the master mm -hmm. narrative to fill in the parts right. that part about that we're not talking about. And so what happens is if I'm talking about I don't know, you know, the building of fortifications. When I need to write just to make sure that the narrative's moving along about some other aspect of, of mm -hmm. the war, I fall back on this master narrative yeah. mm -hmm. that is still tainted in many ways. Mm -hmm. And right. so we can accidentally, as Civil War historians, unknowingly propagate and continue to grow lost cause lies. Yeah. And so that's that for the historians out there who are watching this, that is, I think, a really key takeaway is that we need to really reassess mm -hmm. the way that memory still influences that master narrative of what we've come to expect. Because I think we still expect Confederate soldiers to be exemplary soldiers. And to me, I think we're asking the wrong question. I mean, you know, Confederate soldiers, people for a long time have been saying, how did Confederate soldiers last so long? You know, they lasted four years despite bigger numbers. And my question is the opposite. It's why didn't they last longer? Yeah. I mean, right, when we think about this. Why does the army fall apart, right? They, they fall apart incredibly. The United States military is what, 16,000 men at the beginning of the war. It takes time to grow a military to be mm -hmm. close to a million, you know, over a million men or whatever, you know, to put a million men in arms. It takes a long time to train them, prepare them. Yeah. It's remarkably fast that the war ends when you start putting it in context, that it only mm -hmm. takes four years to defeat the Confederacy George Washington lasted longer and won against the world's most powerful military. Yeah. 
ISIS today now obviously has, has lasted longer against a military that has aircraft carriers and the F-22 and the F-35, right? I mean, like you sort of think about the, the disparate. Now, obviously the strategies being used are different and you have levy on mass since Washington has occurred, right? So you've had lots of changes in sort of how military mobilization occurs. And then of course you have the growth of insurgencies and, and terroristic strategies in the 20th and 21st century that make it distinct. And so it's not a fair comparison, I recognize. But I do think it raises some important questions of, are we asking the right question about Confederate mm -hmm. soldiers that we keep asking, you know, how did they last so long? Maybe we should be asking, did they really last that long? Right. Um, right. And I think that's a, a shift. And I do think um, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm not right. Maybe, maybe they did last longer than, we, than, than it was fair to expect. But I think the reason we were asking that question was memory and not history. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. the important part. And so we do have a lot left to do. Um, as historians.